about it program. And we have got um, two special guests with us tonight who are gonna talk to us about preparing a healthy holiday meal. Um, we ask that participants stay muted during the presentation. And then once the presentation is over, we'll have a Q and A. Um, probably makes the most sense to submit your questions in, um, in the chat box and then I'll ask them because we are recording, if you speak during the Q&A, you, your name and face will show, which is fine if you're comfortable with it. Um, but if you're not, the best thing to do is to ask your question in the chat box. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa and Christina. Lisa Zellig is the Director of Nutrition Services at God's Love We Deliver in New York, a medically tailored food and nutrition program for people living with serious illness. Lisa is a registered dietitian, nutritionist, certified dietitian, nutritionist, and certified specialist in gerontological nutrition. Her expertise in the field of nutrition focuses on public health and community nutrition, aging, and HIV. And then Christina Spano is a graduate student at Hunter College studying nutrition and dietetics. She previously worked at God's Love We Deliver as a client service specialist and is now back as a dietetic intern. So please join me in welcoming Lisa and Christina. They're going to take it from here, and then I'll be back with you during the Q&A part. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the intro, Nancy. Thanks for having us. I hope everybody can see the screen okay. Just wanna make sure, okay. Yep. Great, okay. So I'm Lisa um, and I'm joined with my colleague, Christina. Um, we are from God's Love, we deliver, and we're excited to be here tonight and um, talk to you about holiday meal planning. Um, oh, my, sorry, I have to advance the slides. So tonight we're going to talk, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what God's love, what we are, what we do, and then we'll get into the main part of the presentation, which would be, you know, about eating tips for the holidays, holiday food safety, and then some holiday menus and recipes we're going to go through tonight. Um, and a lot of these are plant-based um, recipes. We're going to have some, some alternatives to look at. So um, if you're not familiar with God's Love, we are a nonprofit, non-sectarian organization that's dedicated to um, alleviating hunger and malnutrition among people living with serious illnesses. So we, we cook um, and deliver high quality nutritious meals to people's homes if they're not able to do that for themselves because of the illness that they're, they're dealing with. Um, and we, I'm a dietitian, as Nancy mentions, we have a staff of dietitians who work with our clients one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And then we also provide you know, nutrition education, uh, counseling to other providers, and we're happy to share with the community like, as we're doing tonight. Just so you know, um, all of our services are provided free to clients. There's no regard for income. Um, it's really people are eligible if they have a diagnosis that affects their ability to shop and cook for themselves. And it's pretty simple. Um, at the end, I'll have some contacts. So if you or you know someone who's living in the New York metropolitan area who could benefit from a program like ours, I really urge you to reach out. Um, and I know some people may be from different places around the country, just know there are agencies like ours around um, in different cities that may be helpful um, if that's something that you need. So, oh, before I go on, I just wanted to just talk about the, our, um, the scope of what we do. We serve, um, last year we served 10,000 people. Um, children included caregivers of people living with serious illness also, um, and we serve 2.5 million meals. And we do this um, through you know, our staff, but also we have thousands of volunteers that help us and have been helping us all through COVID, which has been amazing. Um, we work with other CBOs um, in, the agent, in the area, healthcare um, plans, and, um, and we have wonderful donors that help us do us, our work. 
Okay, so I think we'll get started with what we really want to talk about tonight is eating during eating tips during the holidays and um, ways you can plan uh, a, he a healthy holiday menu. Um, I think, you know, the first thing for the holidays I think of is like, these are the times where you have your, um, your favorite foods and all foods fit. And this is um, a place to make sure that you fit in all the things that you love that remind you that have good memories for you or your family. Um, things that you can't, you know, you don't usually have it at other times of the year, things that are special. And as you do that, you can also look at, you know, your plate and try to make the plate colorful. And um, we always, we say, fill about half your plate with fruits and vegetables. And then, you know, the other things can go around with it. Um, the protein and the carbohydrates, but the vegetables and fruits should be the, you know, a focus of what you're looking at. Um, some other things about the holidays is just, it's always a good reminder um, at any time just to drink water, to keep, keep yourself hydrated. Um, whether or not, um, you know, you're drinking alcohol or, or with the holidays, just that's another thing, but just in general to keep yourself hydrated at all times, it's important. And, you know, enjoy, enjoy your meal and enjoy food. And part of that is really, you know, being present and eating, eating slowly. Um, you know, you want to eat as much as you need, you know, relax for a little bit, maybe you try to look at your, feel your hunger cues and see, you know, am I still hungry or should I just take a break for a little while and see how you feel. Throughout the holidays, the holidays can be stressful um, for many reasons. And I think some of the things to help mitigate that is to stay active, maybe, um, you know, during an event with the family, if you can go for a walk or do some, some kind of activity that takes, you know, can take your uh, mind off that and relax a little bit. And then also um, other strategies are, you know, relaxing in between events, resting and making sure that you're getting enough um, sleep and rest, because that's also important. Um, holidays, you know, holiday schedules can be, can be stressful and um, take you out of your normal routine. Okay. I think, you know, the first thing we wanted to start with is, is about food safety. And, I, and again, this is something that um, we talk a lot about during the holidays because there's some specific things um, to, to think about, but this is also for anyone, anytime. Um, food, um, foodborne illness is um, more, um, people with who are immunocompromised are more susceptible to foodborne illness or food poisoning. So keeping these reminders on top of your mind at all times is, is very important. Um, the first thing that is very helpful, and I think we're all pretty good with washing hands because um, with COVID, that was part of the routine, you know, wash your hands when you come in the house before you, you know, after you, you before you start cooking, et cetera. So keep that in mind. Um, washing your hands again for 20 seconds, um, singing happy birthday to yourself twice is what's recommended. And then also changing your hands, utensils, surfaces like cutting boards in between tasks. So if you are preparing something like turkey or a raw animal product, you wanna make sure after you do that, that you change to a different cutting board, you wash your hands thoroughly to avoid any contamination, cross contamination from any bacteria that might be on the raw, that raw food, like the raw turkey. Um, so you can do that, just washing your hands with soapy water will, is all you need to do and cutting boards and, and anything that can go in the dishwasher. Um, if you have a dishwasher, put it in the dishwasher. If not, you can wash it again with very hot um, soapy water. You could also use um, vinegar to help rinse it off as well. Um, fruits and vegetables, um, we're gonna talk about some specific root vegetables like potatoes, sweet potatoes, carrots, those can be um, rinsed off and you can, if you have a, um, I'm, I'm doing the scrubbing motion if you can't see, um, it, a, a brush, what's it called? A vegetable brush. If you don't, you can, you know, use, use, use some kind of, you know, use your hand to get the, uh, the, any kind of dirt and things off of that. And then you can peel them too, if that's, you know, before you cook them, if you'd like. Um, things that are, label like things that are um, not like a hard vegetable, like a soft, like a green, those things can be you know, rinsed in a colander and dried with um, 
with uh, paper, to clean, paper towels or a clean dish cloth. And things that say that they're pre-washed, they don't have to be washed again. So just keep that in mind, unless, unless that's your preference, you can do that. One thing that I just, um, we always recommend is not to wash um, meat, chicken, or seafood like in your sink, because that really disperses any bacteria that might be on that product might, could be, in, will be now be in your sink, it could be on your counters. It just, um, it, it's, not, um, it's not a safe practice. So just keep that in mind. And then when you're cooking, we have a list here. These are for animal foods. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about turkey, more about thawing turkey. But if you're, if you're cooking meat, you know, taking temperature, the internal temperature, having a thermometer on hand is key to making sure that the food is um, cooked to a safe temperature to kill any bacteria that may, may be there. And here's the list here. Just to note, reheated foods also is a, is a big source of food poisoning. Um, I had that happen to me when I was a kid and I will never forget it. Um, please uh, look at, try to reheat your food to a high piping hot temperature, 165 is what's recommended. And then storing food and leftovers properly. Um, food should be stored ideally within an hour after it's, it's come out, you let it rest of course, but then after that, and about an hour, it should be stored. The refrigerator is made to, you know, to cool foods. So you can put things in there that are still warm. Um, that's what's going to do its job and cool it down. But the key is to use like a shallow container when you're when you're storing foods. So this will allow things to, to chill evenly. Um, if you stuff things into you know too much dense too much if it's too dense it's not going to chill properly. So shallow containers. And then I think the big one is um, is thawing the turkey safely. Always a, a question that we get asked a lot, I think, is how can I do this? Um, what's the best way to do it? And what's the safest way to do it? And we're gonna go into that in the next slide. Okay, so there are three ways to do this. Um, however, I'm just gonna say um, the refrigerator method is the safest way. And this is what I would recommend. Christina and I were talking about this earlier. This is what we would do, this is what we would recommend. It's recommended by the US Department of Agriculture as well. Um, it does take a little time, so you have to plan. Um, for every four to five pounds of turkey, you need to allow one day for defrosting. So if you have a, um, uh, if you have a turkey that's 12 pounds, it's gonna take three days to thaw it. Um, and then once it's defrosted, you have about a day, you have one to two days in which you need to, to cook it. So it gives you, you know, it's just a little bit of pre-planning. Um, the other way, the cold water method is submerging it in a cold, uh, a sink full of cold water and then changing that water every 30 minutes and allowing 30 minutes per, per pound. Um, but then once you defrost it, you need to cook it immediately. So this is not, um, you can't let it, let it sit around a day or two, it has to go into the oven right away. Um, and then the microwave thing, I don't know if anyone has a microwave that's big enough to hold a turkey or a turkey breast even. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't recommend this, but I, we included it to be inclusive. So you know that this technically, there is another way to do it, but um, not the way, uh, not the safest way. And I don't think it's actually quite really practical either. Okay. So now um, we've gone through food safety. Now you're ready to start planning your menu and there's some things to consider. Um, one of them I think is a bit obvious, like well, how many people are you having? Um, is it just you, just you and a friend, more family? Are there any children coming? And that can help you figure out how much food you need and like what types of food, like do I need three vegetables or just two? Um, something like that, or just one. Um, I also um, often um, recommend offsetting. If you, if you wanna make something that's more complicated, maybe one of the recipes that we show you later you might like, and it might be a little bit more complicated, you know, offset that with something that's simpler. Um, try to make, you know, make a game plan that's doable. And if you just wanna, you know, all simple things, that's also, as, that's great as well. It's really, um, this is like 
the world is your oyster, really. Um, you know, you know, you, thinking about if like if it, if you're making complicated things that have to be finished at the last minute, and if you're having people over, you know, you won't um, you will you'll be spending too much time in the kitchen, honestly. So, I think the the most the key point um, besides nutrition and flavors, I think one of the most important things is planning what can be made ahead. Um, I um, do this when I um, plan a holiday or or anything. You know, there's some, there's a couple of dishes that we're going to talk about um, in a little bit. One of them being um, the roasted root vegetables, and then the um, the baked fruit dessert. These things can be made ahead. You can make them the day or two before, and then your the day of, you're kind of your all you have to do is just a few things. It makes it much more um, manageable. And then nutrition, always important. Um, Balancing nutrition, so making sure that you're serving things that are sources of protein. Um, you have carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates with fiber, fruits and vegetables, um, green things, colorful things. So you get lots of vitamins and minerals. That's also um, something something to look at, along with the colors and the flavors. So are, is the, is this a colorful plate, plate, or are you serving everything that's white or gray or you know something like that? Um, especially with the holidays, you know, festive things. And I think the, the, the cauliflower recipe that Christina shows you is really, um, it's pretty. It has lots of different colors in it. Um, and then looking at making sure the flavors are compatible. I mean, they don't have to be all the same theme, but just, you know, that it's, it's an interesting mix. Okay, so um, we're going to talk a lot about some plant-based recipes. And I know just to um, sort of talk before we do that about what is a plant-based diet or a plant-forward diet. You may have heard that term. And that's really, it's just, um, you know, an eating plan that really emphasizes vegetables, whole grains, fruits, nuts, um, legumes, and beans. Um, and the goal is to have the majority of your, um, your, your diet from plant sources. And this could include some animal foods and meat, or it could just be, you know, it could be the complete elimination of that for in some cases, some that are, or just a reduction. Um, it's really like a personal, a personal thing. But I think just, you know, the, I think the gist um, today is that uh, we, you know, having more plant-based foods on your plate um, to promote health. And then, where you know when you're looking at um, using this this um, the plant based like uh, not, not the method I can't think of the word um, oh my gosh when you have that mindset um, how can you do that around a holiday meal because sometimes people think you know a holiday meal is very meat centric um, you know meats could be there in smaller amounts for sure um, you just want to have ample uh, vegetables and other options available, including whole grains, um, which they can be, grains are very versatile. They could be, it could be something like a grain salad, which could be a hard, you know, as a salad or it could be a part of a side dish. Um, they also contain uh, protein and fiber. So wonderful for many reasons. Um, and then healthy fats, you know, using um, fats that come from olives, avocado, nut butters, those things. And I think we have some examples of that in the recipes that we're using later. Greens, always wonderful. And a nice, you know, a nice way to, in, to um, increase your fruits and vegetables is having some kind of fruit for dessert. And um, Christina will, will talk us through a, um, a really seasonal dessert baked fruit recipe that is, is lovely for autumn and winter because there's things in there like, you know, apples, you can, apples, pigs, persimmon, pigs, figs, persimmons, all those kind of um, pomegranate, those kind of things can um, increase your intake of, of, of fruits um, in a really lovely way. Okay, so I am going to pass it over to Christina to talk us through some of these, um, some of these recipes. And so yep. I will... Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Lisa, and hi, everybody. So uh, I'm going to walk us through some recipes that showcase fruits, vegetables, and plant-based proteins. And these can either be used alongside some of your traditional holiday animal proteins like turkey, or uh, you can make them all together to create a balanced vegetarian meal 
that's going to be packed with a variety of flavors and textures and plant-based protein. Um, I also want to mention before I go through all of these that uh, the recipes that we have presented here are tailored to serve approximately four to six uh, people. Um, so this recipe here is uh, the one that Lisa had mentioned, our uh, whole roasted cauliflower with a pomegranate tahini sauce. And this dish uh, is a combination of textures and flavors. We have crunchiness from the nuts, sweetness from the raisins, and a brightness from the herbs and the pomegranates. And cauliflower is high in fiber, antioxidants, and B vitamins. And this dish can be used as a vegetarian main, or you can use it as a side dish alongside a turkey or a roast. So there are two tricks just to ensure that the cauliflower is evenly cooked. Um, so you wanna clean the cauliflower and pat it dry. And once you've done that, uh, you'll wanna trim the green leaves from the bottom and then you're going to uh, cut the bottom of the stem so that your cauliflower will uh, lay flat uh, or you know, stand up flat on your sheet tray. Um, then you'll either want to steam uh, or you can even parboil your cauliflower before you uh, bake it. So this particular recipe calls for steaming with a steamer basket, but if you don't have a steamer basket at home, you can always submerge the whole cauliflower into boiling water. And if you do this method, you'll just wanna make sure that once the cauliflower is in the boiling water that you reduce it to a simmer. And the cauliflower will take about 12 to 15 minutes to cook um, in the boiling water. And you'll just wanna insert a knife just to make sure that it's, um, that it's cooked enough, but you don't wanna overcook it. So you'll just wanna make sure that you're checking it periodically. Um, and so uh, if you do this method where you submerge the whole cauliflower into the boiling water, you can use two spoons or a shallow strainer to transfer the cauliflower from your baking sheet uh, onto your, um, I'm sorry, from your pot onto your baking sheet for roasting. Um, this recipe also does call for a pomegranate molasses. And if you're not able to source this, uh, you know, it's, it's not, not a problem. Um, or if you don't wanna purchase another ingredient, you can always substitute um, and use something that you might have on hand, like a honey. Um, so while your cauliflower is roasting, I mean, you can see here the prep time on this recipe is about 25 minutes. This might be one of the more labor intensive recipes that we've included here. But um, while your cauliflower is roasting in the oven, uh, it takes about 45 minutes to cook. You can get started on your sauce. And the sauce has uh, tahini, lemon juice, the pomegranate molasses, or a substitute like honey, salt, and then some water to thin out the consistency so you can drizzle it on top of the cauliflower when it's out of the oven. And then you can arrange the cauliflower when it's done baking um, in a shallow bowl or on a rimmed plate with your herbs around it um, and on top of it, drizzle it with some sauce and then sprinkle on the raisins and the hazelnuts and the pomegranate seeds so it looks really pretty and festive. And before moving on to our next recipe, I did just wanna quickly walk through, cause I personally had found cutting a pomegranate to be intimidating until I figured out a way to do it. <laughs> so I had two pomegranates here at home. So I'm gonna do a quick uh, tutorial. I already cut the pomegranate, but I did just wanna show you. I feel like it's easier when you can see it. So, um, okay, so here's our pomegranate. And um, so what you're gonna wanna do is you're going to want to um, start by cutting off the top of the pomegranate. So it's actually gonna look like this, okay? Um, so you'll cut off the pomegranate, uh, the top of the pomegranate. And what you'll see when you look at a pomegranate are that there are um, some ridges, kind of natural ridges in the fruit. And you're going to want to score just lightly on those ridges without cutting completely through the pomegranate, but you just wanna cut through um, the white pith, which is actually pretty thick. So if you're paying attention here, you, you, you shouldn't really cut through it into the seed. Um, so after you make these cuts, you can use your hands to actually just kind of pry the fruit open and you'll wanna divide it into segments. It'll come open into segments after you kind of score the outside of it. And it will look like this. And then you can take one of these segments. Oh, okay. You could take one of these segments and then you'll submerge it into water, into a large bowl of water. 
and use your hand to um, kind of just move the, uh, the seed away from um, the white part here. And I actually removed one of the segments so you could see here at the bottom. Um, oh, <laughs> we have our seeds. <laughs> and then uh, we've got um, kind of the white part floating on the top. Um, okay, so I think we can move on to the next slide. Can I ask a quick oh. question about the, yeah. um, so you said that you can submerge the cauliflower in boiling water if you don't have a steamer yeah. basket to accommodate it. Do you need to let it dry for a little bit in order for it to roast properly? Or is it, can it go right from the water to the pan? Yeah, I think you just want to drain it so there's not like excess water, um, but it doesn't have to really dry. Okay. Got yeah. It. And then I, I saw you mentioned uh, unsulfured green raisins in the recipe. Um, mm -hmm. I've never heard of those. Where would one find unsulfured green raisins? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that's another one of those kind of like specialty ingredients that I think you could honestly just replace. I think a good replacement for that might be like a golden raisin, which I think would be easier to probably find in most yeah. of your stores. Yeah. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so our next recipe here is for French lentils with garlic and thyme. And this can be used alongside roasted vegetables, which we're gonna walk through um, in uh, more detail in a few slides. But you can also use something like this alongside our whole roasted cauliflower to create a balanced vegan meal. Um, the lentils are high in fiber and they contain folic acid and potassium. And they're also packed with a plant-based protein and they make a really excellent replacement for meat. They're really hearty. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So um, you can see here the prep time for this is just 10 minutes and it can be cooked using uh, just one pot, which makes it an easy one to put together. Uh, and this is one of the recipes that you actually can make ahead. And then you just wanna make sure that you reheat it before you serve it if you do make it ahead. Okay, next slide. Okay, and so here we have our chopped salad with apples and uh, bitter lettuces. So this is super refreshing. Um, it uses tart, juicy apples and then a variety of bitter lettuce like radicchio, endive, or escarole. I actually just made this salad and I used um, arugula in it. It was really tasty. Um, and apples are a great source of fiber. They have vitamin C and an array of antioxidants. And bitter lettuce like radicchio is also rich in fiber, antioxidants, and vitamin K. And it's also thought that bitter lettuces can help us with digestion, which I think it's always good at the holidays when we're eating lots of different flavors and foods. Um, this is a really nice uh, dish to eat to kind of cut through maybe some of the richer dishes. And um, so this recipe, just to highlight some of the ingredients here that you know might be a little harder to find or if you don't have on hand, it's not a problem. Um, but you know it calls for a sherry or a champagne vinegar and balsamic. So instead of using two different vinegars, you know, you can just double up on the balsamic vinegar. So using one table of balsamic plus one teaspoon, because it also uses lemon juice. Um, you could also kind of use a combination of both of those to make up for that tablespoon of either the sherry vinegar or the champagne vinegar um, if you uh, didn't have it. And, um, and then also the walnut oil um, is not necessary. It might change the flavor of the recipe just a bit, but it's again, it's um, you know a little expensive and also not the easiest to find. So if you didn't have it on hand, you can always just replace that with some more of the extra virgin olive oil. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So uh, this dressing can be made ahead. And actually I think it would um, really enhance the flavor if it were made ahead because um, there's some raw garlic in it. So it really like, it's a very flavorful uh, dressing. Um, and then for the day of, you can just chop your salad ingredients and then um, mix in your dressing right before you're ready to serve it, just to make sure everything stays nice and crisp. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, all right, so this is the baked fruit dessert that Lisa had mentioned. And this is another one of our dishes that we can make ahead. This recipe does not have any added sugar. Um, it's only lightly sweetened with raisins and flavored with cinnamon. 
And so if you made something like this with the cauliflower, you can buy your raisins and use it for both recipes. So we tried to also find ingredients um, that were kind of common amongst the recipes. Um, if you did decide that you maybe wanted to try out making these together as a plant-based menu. Um, and so uh, the apples in here, pears and persimmons are all really great seasonal fruits for roasting. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is another uh, pretty simple recipe with just 10 minutes of prep time. The fruit will bake for 35 to 45 minutes. Um, and if you do make this ahead, again, you just wanna make sure that you reheat it before serving it. You can also um, keep a batch of leftovers in the fridge and pair it with uh, either an oatmeal or you can uh, snack on it with a nut butter. It's really good. Okay, next slide. And then um, lastly, as we wrap up this presentation, um, you know, we want to talk about um, our roasted root vegetables. Um, we're going to walk through this recipe in more detail, um, but this is really a star of a plant-based plate. Um, roasted ve root vegetables are packed with fiber and nutrients, and they're typically inexpensive and pretty easy to prepare. Um, they're also great to have on hand. If you're pre-making them, you can keep them in the refrigerator and then, you know, heat them up and use them in a variety of different recipes and meals outside of the holidays. They're also really fantastic when they're paired with cruciferous vegetables, like our whole roasted cauliflower, um, or also broccoli, Brussels sprouts, greens, beans. So alongside our lentil dish, um, and then whole grains, you can use it to kind of make like a grain bowl. Um, but they're really a great addition to lots of different meals. Next slide. Okay, so there are a variety of different root vegetables that you might find at your local market. Um, in this picture here, you can see, and we've highlighted some of them on the slide, but things like potatoes, onions, beets, carrots, turnips, parsnips, and fennel, those are all um, really great. They all taste awesome together. Um, you can see in the picture too, we have a leek, which really makes a nice flavor. It caramelizes when it's roasting. So it's really, really tasty. Um, and vegetables like sweet potato, onion, and carrots, which we're going to talk about in more detail, are great sources of vitamin A, C, K. They also have calcium and magnesium and potassium, folate, and fiber. So um, let's take a look at what we would need to make a batch of roasted root vegetables. And this is just um, gonna include, oh yeah, we went to our next slide. So this for this particular recipe, we're just gonna be including um, carrots, sweet potato and onion. But um, at the end, I'm gonna walk through some other uh, vegetables that you can use for roasting. So if we're making this particular recipe, um, we would wanna have four to five carrots two sweet potatoes and two onions. And then you would need uh, one to two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. And you can include uh, spices that you might have on hand in the pantry like a garlic powder, paprika, cayenne pepper. You can also include fresh herbs like rosemary, thyme and sage around this time of the year. Um, they're really, um, very seasonal and I actually don't even cut those herbs when I put them in. Um, I'll clean them and then I'll put them in whole while I'm roasting the vegetables. And the vegetables really take on the flavor of those um, herbs and the kitchen smells amazing. <laughs> um, so you'll also wanna have a, a knife on hand, preferably a sharper knife to cut through all these vegetables and a cutting board. And then a bowl just to toss the vegetables in olive oil and then your sheet pan for roasting. Okay, next slide. Okay, so before you get started with your um, veggie prep, you'll wanna just preheat your oven to 425. Um, when we're roasting vegetables, we just wanna make sure the oven is very hot. Otherwise it will take a long time for your vegetables to cook and also to cook evenly. So you'll want to preheat the oven to 425 and then line your um, baking sheet with parchment paper. So after your oven's heated, you've got your sheet tray ready, you can start prepping your vegetables. So starting with an onion, um, 
you'll want to uh, remove both ends of the, of, of the onion. And you can remove about a half inch from the top, but then on the bottom where the root is, um, you'll see like kind of the stringiness at the bottom. You can just cut a little bit off of that, about one eighth of an inch. You wanna take more off of the top of the onion. Um, so the next you're gonna place the onion flat now that you've cut off a little bit from the top and the bottom, and you're going to cut through it through the center. Um, and you're gonna want to have um, the top half uh, sorry, the shallow, the, the shallower part is going to be on the top. So the part that you cut off more would be on the bottom. And then you're going to just cut right through in half. Um, and then you'll have your two halves of the onion. You can peel off the outer skin and then lay them both flat on your cutting board. And then you're going to want to cut those into uh, one inch chunks. Um, then you can uh, rinse your carrots and your sweet potatoes. And um, you don't have to actually peel these if you don't want to, um, but you can just give them an extra scrub if you have a vegetable brush, like Lisa had mentioned. You can, um, you know, while they're running under the water, just give them a little bit of an extra scrub. And, you know, like I said, there's no need to add in a step to peel them. Just cleaning at them will be, will be fine. Um, so then you're going to pat them dry. And then you would want to cut these also into one inch chunks. And the key when you're roasting vegetables is to just make sure that all of your chunks, uh, all your little pieces are the same size because this will just ensure that they have approximately the same cooking time. And so once all of your vegetables are chopped, you can either put them into a bowl or if you don't want to um, you know, dirty another bowl, um, oh, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Um, if you don't want to dirty another bowl, you can always just put them right onto the um, the sheet tray. The bowl is nice because it you know allows you to kind of like toss the vegetables and get an even coating on them with the olive oil. But if you put them directly onto your sheet tray and you just drizzle the olive oil, um, I actually just like to use my hands to kind of um, rub the oil onto each of the pieces. Uh, and it's a good way to just make sure that they're all coated. Um, so, once your vegetables are coated in oil and they're spread out on your sheet tray, uh, you'll wanna just sprinkle evenly with some salt and pepper. And at this point, you can add on any of your herbs and spices that you have on hand. And now the vegetables are ready to go. They'll go into the oven and you'll cook them for about 35 to 45 minutes or until they're tender. And you'll actually see that they start to caramelize as well. And you can test the doneness if you try to take a fork and just stick it through the pieces. If you're able to get through a few of those pieces there, um, then you know the vegetables are, are likely done. And so, um, you know, like I mentioned, these are very versatile. You can use them with your holiday meal planning, but you can also use roasted vegetables in recipes like plant-based tacos, grain salads, or just salad bowls. Um, a quiche or a frittata, savory oatmeal for breakfast, and even in a stir fry, if you had leftover rice or not, just but you can kind of just mix in even a bunch of leftovers and just make um, a little stir fry that you heat up on the stove. Um, okay, next slide. Um, and then lastly, we have this uh, guide that was created by the New York Times that just talks about um, different vegetables that you can roast. So even outside of the holiday season, just thinking ahead, you know, there's lots of different uh, vegetables that you can roast and use in different um, dishes. You can see that, you know, there's not just the root vegetables here. There's chickpeas, uh, summer squash, tomatoes, asparagus, and eggplant. So you can really get creative. Like we're roasting fruit for our other recipe. It's just a really great cooking method to have, you know, it's quick prep time and then your food is in the oven and, you know, in about 35 to 45 minutes, it's usually done. And that's what I've got. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, that was great. I Before we take questions, I just wanted to show you our contacts here. Um, this is the God's Love website. There's lots of nutrition information on there. Um, if you go to godslovewedeliver.org and then to the nutrition section, we have um, information and books um, on different topics, including breast cancer and nutrition. 
Um, and you're welcome to those are they're available as downloads. And if you'd like a copy, you could also reach out to us and we could um, mail you a copy. And if you are no, if you um, know of anyone in your um, in your uh, community, your family, who could use a cert our service. I also have our client services phone number and uh, email there too. We, um, I just, uh, you know, encourage you to uh, reach out if um, if there's a need. And I will stop sharing, and we can take questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, please feel free, feel free to ask your question out loud if you'd like to, or just type it into the chat. Um, I have gotten a couple of questions just directed to me. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with those. And then, like I said, if, if there are others, please feel free. Um, Lisa and Christina, what are your thoughts on organic versus non-organic fruits and vegetables? I'll start, I guess, and then Christina, if you wanna add. I think, um, you may, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. They're a group that puts out, they, um, have a list of fruits and vegetables from the highest to the lowest, uh, that are highest to lowest amount of spraying or pesticides. So they have something called the Clean 15. I think it's called in the Dirty Dozen. And if that, if you know, organic produce, I think the ones that are the the, the dirtiest, you know, for the lack of a better word, those are the ones that I would recommend um, you you know purchasing organic if you can. Um, not, you know, also you can, you can peel things um, as well to remove some of that, some of it, but the clean ones are ones that are not highly sprayed. And those are things that, you know, it's no, I don't think it's a, I would, re I would recommend to people to buy those conventional, or don't worry about it because it's, you know, if you, if you're trying to balance out, you know, um, spending, the ones that are the most sprayed are the ones to purchase organic versus conventional. Um, and that, that list can be found, I, it, I believe it's ewg.org and they update it periodically. Um, I don't know, I can't tell you off the top of my head what the most, um, the, one of the most sprayed products though is con, um, conventional strawberries. I think that's the number one. That's the only one that I remember off the top of my head, but you know, you can take a look and see, you can strategize, you know, okay, I, I, I like this vegetable, I buy it, this is the one that I would buy organic versus, you know, the other ones, I, I, there's, I don't have an issue with because they're not um, highly sprayed and they do a lot of good research. So I would um, point people to that resource. Great. And just kind of a two-parter to that one. Do, um, do any of the kind of fruit and vegetable washes you can find at the grocery store or Trader Joe's help with any of the, um, you know, toxins on conventional fruits and vegetables or are those more gimmicky? Oh, I'm unmuted. Uh, it's my impression that those are more gimmicky. Um, Lisa, I'd love to know your feedback on this, but I don't think that they're necessary. Uh, you know, you can just yeah. really wash them under just water. And, you know, having a vegetable brush on hand is really nice to just kind of scrub away some of the uh, kind of excess dirt maybe on the outside of them and then just patting them dry. And I think that that's, you know, totally sufficient for, for cleaning the fruits and vegetables. And you just want to use the vegetable brush on something that's a little bit more sturdy, like a sweet potato or a carrot or maybe an apple, but you know, not like on a berry or something. Right. All right. I have a few more, but does anybody else have a question before I move on to the other ones that came in the, through the chat? Okay. Um, one question that came through is, Kind of steps to take to get closer to a plant-based diet. I mean, we hear that phrase often and it's it can sound intimidating. Um, so do you have any recommendations on kind of steps to take to get closer to that? I can start and then Christina. Um, I think, you know, looking at your your, you know, I think that's what we were trying to impart was that this is, this is not an all or nothing um, thing to achieve. And, 
reducing the animal product and I mean, reducing meat, but then also um, increasing vegetables. So maybe look at it like day by day. You know, on on Mondays, I'm going to have this and for, you know, one meal or maybe if you have meat or animal products three times a day, you look at it like, okay, I'm going to try twice a day, just like smaller steps that are really more doable, I think is helpful. I think, you know, having some things on hand is also um, a good, like Christina was talking about the roasted vegetables, like if you like vegetables. Um, but you know, you're not, you don't want to cook them every night because it does, you know, it takes a little bit of time, you know, do a big batch and then you can have them for meals throughout the next couple of days, perhaps. And then you can accompany with it. Maybe you accompany with like a bean dish one night, maybe you have a chicken one night or fish or something, but you're ensuring that you have something um, to, to like, to round out that meal, whatever the protein is. Um, I think, you know, looking at your, looking either either by the day or by like the week and kind of planning out a little bit. Um, Christina, you might have some other tips that are, other are helpful too. Yeah, um, I, I was gonna, you know, suggest similar things and just also looking at the meat maybe as your side dish instead of the main portion and mm -hmm. just incorporating smaller pieces of it so that it, you know, you're, it's not about, it doesn't have to be about fully like completely cutting it out, um, but just cutting back, like Lisa mentioned, but even just in your actual dish that you're, that you're putting together, just not having the meat be the center of the dish. Um, and, you know, I would also really encourage finding the recipes that you like that are plant-based. And like Lisa said, having things on hand, I think that's going to be um, also really important um, to have some go-to things as you're building your, your meals every day. Yeah. I think that's a good point, having things like go to things that you um, are comfortable making and that are in your repertoire and that, you know, it just adding those things in looking for recipes and, and adding those into your, you know, your weekly rotation or whatever it is that you how you cook. Yeah. Great. And if um, I was just going to say, like, if using something like dried beans, like we have with the lentils feels like intimidating, you know, also canned beans are great um, and just looking at the sodium content of those and rinsing off um, you know whatever is it, it, it's in the can with it um, but you know I throw beans into lots of different dishes it's just a good protein to have on hand that's you know plant-based and um, really easy when you go with uh, some of the canned versions of them. Yeah that's a good point I mean the cans are, are convenient and I use them all the time too Something like a lentil, I mean, you, you may, this is easier to cook. You don't need to soak it. Um, it cooks quickly. So those are like lentils or split peas are, are kind of a, an easier, less time consuming. Um, but then for other beans, you know, the can, the can versions are fine. Um, and like, yeah. just, I would just recommend what Christina said, rinsing them in a colander um, before you, you use them in something. Okay. Great. Um, I got another question. So what are the pros and cons of um, some of the meat substitutes? And do you find that those help people get their protein, you know, help towards a plant-based diet? Christina, do you, you nod and do you want to start? I don't know. I have mixed feelings because um, <laughs> I just as a vegetarian myself, um, I do try to stay away from from some of the overly processed um, meat substitutes. So just looking at the ingredients of the things that you buy. Um, you know, I love tofu. I know you, know, you can find some, some recipes for that, um, but just including some more natural plant-based proteins like the tofu, or um, I love like incorporating um, adamame or maybe having that as a snack, um, boiled or steamed, um, and then using nuts and nut butters and um, beans in a lot of dishes and whole grains as well Yeah, for protein. But um, yeah, I think just looking at the labels and just making sure, cause you know, it might be a uh, vegetarian, but it can also be very processed. And so I like to try to stay with, you know, some of the more natural plant-based protein options. What would we look I, I, for in a, in a label to kind of indicate that it's overly processed? Um, lots of ingredients, um, 
lots of chemical names that you can't pronounce. I think I, I use seitan um, at home a lot, which is, you know, like wheat, wheat gluten. Um, and I use that in stir fries instead of like chicken or something. And I like, I like that. I think that's one of the ones that we eat the most of, but I think they have a lot of like, you know, um, like I'm thinking like morning star, I don't want to call out brands, sorry. Um, but you know, they have like fr frozen, um, veggie pat, like, um, like sausage and things like that. And I'll, I will eat those occasionally uh, to be truthful, but um, not like, not a lot. And I think there's a lot of um, soy isolates in there and different um, other, um, in, just a lot of ingredients. And I, I do avoid that. I like, I think what you said, Christina, makes a lot of sense is like the more, um, more whole the food, um, the better. And same thing with like the Beyond Burger and Possible Meats, like th those fall into that same category, I assume. Yeah, I, I, I do have used those um, at home um, occasionally, but they're not, you know, they're not, um, I think, you know, for someone who's, who's um, making, you know, make taking steps to change, that might be like this in-between thing, you know, with like if you eat burgers like a lot and that's a thing you love and this gives you the, the, the flavor, um, the, the flavor um, profile, the, the, you know, the smell, the aroma, and it's satisfying. I think that's like, that's part of, you know, you need, need to eat things that make you happy too. Right. So I think it's, it's a good, it's a good in-between thing. And maybe once you get there, you can start trying other things like, you know, more of the, the little gooms, like she mentioned, or um, seitan or something like that. But um, I don't, you know, I think it's kind of a, it's a, a middle step maybe and something to be eaten um, occasionally as yeah. well. Okay. Um, you mentioned you mentioned beans and that there are some benefits to dry rather than canned beans. Um, are, are the benefits worth the extra effort to soak dry beans versus having a can? I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a while. Um, like Lisa mentioned, like lentils cook pretty quickly but other beans that you need to soak ahead of time can take a long time to cook, like upwards of 45 minutes. And then you still feel like they're still not cooked just right sometimes, mm -hmm. depending on the pot that you're using and how old the beans are and how long you soak them ahead of time. So I think that it's just more of a barrier to getting like a tasty final product. If <laughs> you just use the can at times, it can be easier depending on what you're making. Yeah, fair. Okay. Um, and then a few more questions. We've got about six more minutes. Um, so what are your recommendations on seafood? And is, do you recommend seafood other, over other different animal products? I would say yes. Um, especially the, like the fatty, like the fish, that's a fatty fish, like salmon, the, uh, the oily fish that has omega-3 fatty acids in it. Those are really heart healthy anti-inflammatory. Um, they, they taste, I think they taste good too. If you eat seafood, um, you know, there's recommendations to eat fish at least twice a week. Um, and to look at the fish, um, that you're buying and try to buy the, you know, eat the ones that are lower in mercury, um, more often. So I do recommend eating seafood, um, for different reasons, anti-inflammatory, you know, it's good for any, for, for everybody including people living with different, um, you know, conditions. Also, it's good for your brain. Um, there's just a lot of benefits to it. So I, you know, when I, I eat, um, I eat fish a couple times a week and uh, we serve it at God's love a couple times a week. Um, I think it's a good source of protein also. Um, it's not, a, you know, the saturated, it's not like um, it has less saturated fat, <coughs> excuse me, than other types of animal protein. And I think it has these, the beneficial, um, not all fish, but you know, it, it, there's a range. Some are um, better than others and their, their uh, omega-3 profile. Those are the yeah. ones I would focus on. And you know, the thing about tuna, um, canned tuna, you may, may have, um, you, you may be aware of this, but like the canned albacore tuna versus the chunk 
the chunk white or chunk light it's called the chunk light actually has less mercury than the other one that's more expensive so you might think about just opting for that one the the chunk light i think it's called sorry can't remember the name but um and so canned salmon canned salmon is a great um yeah. thing to yeah. have in the house too um, you know, it's something you can put into like, you know, if you cooked a grain, you could mix it with a grain and a roasted vegetable, for example, and have a really lovely, lovely meal. It's um, easy, you know, you just mash it with the fork and you want to, you know, make sure you, if you're using canned salmon, you might know that there's little bones in there and you but those are good. They're, they have calcium, but you just need to make sure that you completely mash them with your, with your utensil. So they're crushed up. If you have any swallowing problems though, that I would just be, you know, cautious because that can get caught in your throat if you're if your swallowing mechanism isn't um uh is if there's any if issues with that. But canned salmon is a great thing to have in the house. It's easy, it's healthy. Um we we when we um when we do emergency bags, we do give canned fish um mm. to our clients who eat fish. Got it. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to end with my question um, for you guys. So at the beginning, I think your first bullet was um, all foods fit. And I think that that's probably good news to everybody um, with the holidays coming up. But how do you, uh, you have some tips on kind of overdoing it on all foods fit um, and, and how to keep from overdoing it there? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's part of, um, you know, you may have heard of something called intuitive eating and really listening to your hunger cues. Uh, and I think I talked about that a little bit, but I think, you know, all foods do fit and, you know, depriving yourself isn't, um, isn't the way to go having maybe smaller portions of things. So you, you know, cause I know the holidays, there's lots of stuff to choose from and, you know, I like finding you, fitting in your favorites for sure, I think is important, but also, you know, listening to your hunger cues and like, you know, zero to, I think the, the scale, let's say is zero to 10 and like zero is like, you know, you're starving, you have, you haven't eaten in, you know, a day and you, you would eat, you know, bite off a leg of something and eat it. And then 10 is over full, like stuffed. And I think the goal is not to get to the 10, but to be more like a seven or an eight, you know, you feel comfortable. Um, and, um, but so checking in with yourself, I think is the key to that, checking in with your hunger. And I think, um, you know, we, we all, and I'm, I'm not, I'm part of this, I'm not uh, guiltless, but we all eat really quickly. Um, and we kind of forget that. And if you look back at, you know, kids, babies, they know when they're full and they stop eating. Um, and that's, you know, thinking back to, they have very good, um, sense of their hunger and they cry when they're hungry and then they eat and then they're full and then they're like, that's it. You know, I've had enough. So listening to your um, body and, you know, knowing what you take is, is all, um, uh, you know, all your choices are good. There's no bad or good foods. I think we're, as dietitians, we are moving away from that a hundred percent. I think we have moved away from that a hundred percent that, you know, there, that, um, really there's no, you know, giving things like a bad or good, a negative or a positive connotation is not helpful to people and not, and not helpful. You know, I think the key is like what Christina said and what I said, like making your plate a colorful plate. And if half of it is fruits and vegetables, you're doing fine, you know, and whatever other things that you choose, they all can, they all have a place, but just listen to your body and, um, uh, and, and honor it really. I hope that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, no, I, that's great. That's, that's perfect. Excellent. Well, we are right at seven o'clock. Um, so thank you so much, Lisa and Christina. This was really incredible. And I'm excited to make some of the recipes um, <laughs> that Christina went through. They look really good. Um, so thank you all for taking the time with us tonight. Thanks for, to everybody for joining. I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving um, and we will reconvene the third Tuesday in December for our last one of um, 2021. So thanks again and um, have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Happy, happy holidays, holidays everyone. Bye. Happy holidays. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.